Hello, let's go through another example of following the scientific method and uh, some of the terms that, that go into that. So uh, we're going we're gonna to follow uh, little Johnny and his sweet grandmother. Uh, little Johnny watches uh, sweet, sweet grandmama uh, bake bread, and he's curious as to what makes the bread rise, what makes the, what's the loaf get expand as it sits. And uh, she, she tells him that it's the yeast, uh, that that is in the uh, loaf of bread feed on the sugar that's that she puts in the in the bread, and that they uh, release a gas and that forms bubbles and that causes the the bread to rise. Uh, so little Johnny is wondering, well, uh, since the the yeast feed on the sugar, I wonder how the uh, it will affect the size of the bread loaf if we use different amounts of sugar. How will that affect how much it rises? Um, and just a little side note here, there's uh, effect and affect. Uh, effect is a noun. Uh, affect is a verb. So you affect a change, but you you look up for the effect of something. Um, so little, I have to remind myself of that as I'm using those. Which one I'm which one I'm using? Normally you use uh, the the word effect uh, when you're talking about things. So step two is gather information. So little Johnny researches uh, baking and fermentation, because that's what it's called when the yeast uh, eat up the sugar and make carbon dioxide. And he comes up with a conclusion. I'm sorry, he comes up with a hypothesis. Uh, so that's step three. So he did the research and he forms a hypothesis. Uh, and he thinks that if you add more sugar, then the bread will, will rise higher. And that makes sense because the yeast feed on the sugar. So the more sugar they have, the more gas they'll produce. And, Therefore, the, the bigger the loaf of bread will be. So that makes sense. So um, so a hypothesis uh, is going to mention both the independent and the dependent variable. It's defining a predicted relationship between them. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about independent and dependent variables here in just a second. Um, now, I wonder if you guys know what the independent and dependent variable for this experiment would be. Remember, the independent variable is the cause of change, is what we're going to change directly. And the dependent variable is what's going to change as a result. It is the, the effect of, of change. So what are we going to change directly? We're going to change uh, the amount of sugar. So a factor within the experiment that is changed directly by the experiment it is the cause of change. John's going to use, uh, Johnny's going to use different amounts of sugar, and that is going to be the independent variable, what he's changing directly. The dependent variable, what's supposed to change as a result? Well... That is the, uh, the size of the loaf of bread. Okay, that's what's supposed to change as a result, is the effect. So he thinks um, more, ye more sugar equals bigger loaf. So he sets a, an experiment, works with his teacher, and they come up with uh, uh, a set of uh, procedures to follow. Now, when you're setting up your experiment, you need to consider your control group. And your control group is the standard of comparison, and it's typically the normal conditions that you normally do things at, or it's the no treatment. If you remember before, I, I know I, I hit on no treatment a little bit more than normal conditions, but it's either the normal conditions or the no treatment. Um, specifically, we're talking about the independent variable. Uh, what could be the control in this experiment? So since we're testing the effect of sugar, what we would probably consider the uh, the control would be the normal amount of sugar. Um, so because Grandma used 50 grams of sugar, little Johnny is going to use that as his control group. So now everything else we want to keep the same. Okay. Well, all we're going to do is we're going to have uh, we're going to have one loaf of bread at 50 grams, and then we're going to have more or less sugar than that. But everything else we want to keep the same. What sort of things would we want to keep the same between the trials? Uh, well, we'd want to keep the, uh, and, and again, these are constants. Constants are what don't change. The control is the 50-gram trial. The constant is what doesn't change, such as the type of sugar. We wouldn't want to use uh, brown sugar in one and, and uh, white sugar in another one. Uh, the amount of flour and water, the, uh, the amount of time given to rise, um, and you can come up with these, you know, ad nauseum, um, because the, everything else should be the same. Um, so these are some different examples here. Okay, so what he's going to do is he's going to uh, he's going to do uh, more than one trial for each one to limit experimental error. Uh, so he's going to do each sugar variable test. He's going to do it three times. 
So uh, now when we when we collect our data, we want to put it in uh, some manner that's that makes it fairly easy to uh, analyze. And that's step step five, analyze the data. Uh, so here what we've got is, is the amount of sugar, 25, 50, 100, 200, 500. And then he did each amount of sugar he did three times, and then he took the average. That's very commonly done. Um, why is doing three times better than one? Well, who knows? Uh, it could have had a fluke batch of bad yeast for one of the trials or something along those lines. Um, and this way you can tell uh, if one of them does, does sticks out, then, then something must have been wrong. So uh, analyze the data, put the data in a, uh, in a, uh, a table format if, if applicable. Um, so now we've collected our data and we want to analyze our results. Uh, so was his hypothesis true? The more sugar, the, uh, the bigger the, the loaf of bread. Um, no, it's certainly not true. Um, the size of the, the loaf got smaller and smaller after a certain point. So it rose here and then uh, decreased a little bit and then continued to decrease. So he's thinking maybe there's a, uh, um, a better amount than, than 50 grams. Uh, maybe, maybe if he tests some uh, different amounts around the around 50 to 100 grams, what uh, maybe it'll, it'll work out even better. So um, anyway, he rejects his hypothesis because volume does not continue to rise with more sugar. Uh, as we said before. So how might he can prove his experiment? He's going to retest and this time he's going to use uh, uh, he's going to go up by by 10 grams and go for between 50 and 100 and uh, he does find that grandma's 50 grams of sugar is not actually the best amount of sugar to use. 70 grams is actually what yields the the, the greatest the greatest volume. So uh, he learned something in this experiment. Maybe grandma will make fluffier bread from now on. So he finds that 70 grams produce the largest loaf. And that's, that's what he uh, comes to the conclusion of. Um, okay. So uh, when we talk about scientific conclusions, uh, if there's something that's been repeatedly tested over and over and over again, and is fairly important, um, the conclusion will get will become either a scientific law or a scientific theory. Uh, Laws explain what will happen. They tell you what, what you expect to see. Uh, theories attempt to explain why things happen. So laws uh, are what, and theories are explain why. Uh, what would be an example of those? Well, the law of gravity is just what, come, what goes up will come down. It's just a law because it doesn't tell you why things fall down. It just tells you if you drop something, it's going to fall down. So that's what you can expect to happen. In order to try to explain gravity, Einstein uh, did so in his special theory of relativity um, where, where mass, uh, an object with mass, tends to bend um, space and time, causing space and time to curve, and that's more than we need to get into here, but um, that is a theory because he's trying to explain why things fall down or appear to fall down. Um, Another, another important thing, this, this is important, um, no matter how much an idea has been tested and, and quote-unquote proven true, and no matter how many times an object has, has uh, predicted the correct results, it can never be uh, proven absolutely true. Um, any, any one experiment can prove it false, and no matter, a, a million experiments can't prove it true, but it only takes one to prove an, uh, prove an idea false. Um, so um, our ideas are, are often change about, about uh, nature, um, but, but nature doesn't change. Uh, for example, our ideas about the atom. Uh, initially, we thought atoms were solid balls, okay? And then uh, the plum pudding model came about when we noticed that there must be electrons. Um, and uh, then later on, the Rutherford, uh, the gold foil experiment, they, uh, they determined that there's a nucleus to the atom, a positive nucleus. And then later on, that model is, is um, um, changed to the quantum mechanical model, which is, again, well beyond what we need to be going into this class. And do, um, uh, this class. But uh, interesting stuff nonetheless. Uh, Einstein, and we all agree, Einstein was a pretty smart guy. 
So no number of experiments can prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. Um, and uh, if he says that, then then um, we could probably pretty much believe it. Um, okay. And just a side note, uh, this is kind of counterintuitive, but a hypothesis is not considered to be a scientific hypothesis if it cannot be proven wrong. So if we have the hypothesis that rock music is better than classical music, okay, no one can prove that wrong because that's a matter of opinion. So that's not a scientific hypothesis. Um, there are laws of physics which cannot be discovered. That is not a scientific hypothesis because it can't be proven wrong. Uh, if there are laws of physics we can't discover them, well, we'll never discover them to prove that this is incorrect. So um, anyway, just kind of a side note. Uh, what I, what, what I want to do is go through uh, worksheet 105 real quick together, and then um, I will want you to uh, finish up 1.1 for the next class period, so hold on. So this worksheet, we're just going to work together. Um, it's, a, it's, a little, uh, it's a little bit of a funny worksheet, but so uh, for, some interest, uh, for some reason, we're interested in how pumpkins float when we put them in water. Do they float with the stem going up, or do they float with the stem uh, underneath the water going down? Okay. So what we do is we propose that a pumpkin, any pumpkin placed in water will float with the stem up. Okay. In other words, we have formed a what? A hypothesis. Okay. So one of our vocabulary words. Uh, B, is the above uh, claim scientific? Remember that last slide that we covered? An object, uh, an, a claim can only be considered scientific if it can be proven wrong. Uh, would it, would it be possible to prove my idea wrong that any pumpkin will float stem side up? Yeah. Okay. All I have to do is put in a pumpkin and have it one float stem side down and it's proven incorrect. Okay. So uh, is my claim is scientific. B is, is yes. Uh, has my claim been proven correct? Do I know that any time I put a pumpkin in it's going to float stem side up? No. Okay. I haven't even tested it once. So let's run an, uh, an experiment. So we're going to test 100 pumpkins, and we, we find that every pumpkin that we put in that water floats stem side up. So we form a conclusion that any pumpkin placed in water will float stem side up. Uh, letter D, um, is, is the sentence above, okay, is that a uh, scientific law or a scientific theory? Is it a law or a theory? Is it telling us what to see, law, or is it trying to explain why theory? Well, it's just telling us what to expect. So it's a, it's a law. So we've got the, the law of floating pumpkins. Has my claim been proven correct? I've tested 100 pumpkins and they all float stem side up. Is my, my, is my statement correct? Has it been proven true? No. There are plenty of other pumpkins that, that could float stem side down. I don't know. And so what we're going to do is now we're going to test every pumpkin on the earth. It's a little impractical, but just bear with me. And we found that every single pumpkin on the entire planet earth, when put in water, floats stem side up. Okay. At this point, has my claim been proven correct? No. Remember, you can never uh, prove a scientific claim to be uh, absolutely correct. Okay. You can only strengthen it. Um, how, what could possibly happen that would prove it incorrect? Well, a pumpkin might grow tomorrow that that um, will float stem side down, so that would that would prove my 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 uh, law uh, incorrect. So next, we're going to propose a a uh, an idea that when a pumpkin is placed in water, it floats stem side up because the bottom half of the pumpkin is heavier. Now here we're trying to explain why pumpkins float stem side up in the water. Okay, so we're moving from a scientific law to a scientific theory. So um, a little bit about that. So anyway, have a enjoy the rest of your day.